Radio. I am Wendy from Artemis. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. June. Yes, and you know, we've been hearing Dr. June talk about CBD and the cannabis industry and everything for the last two episodes. If you missed those, the first one was just an introduction to CBD. The second one we talked about dosing and different delivery methods and just all of the, the more um, details that you would need uh, if you want to take CBD and incorporate it into your life. But today I'm really excited because we're going to take a little step back and actually understand what makes Dr. June so special. And this is actually one of my, I'm very excited for this episode. Um, but Dr. June, tough questions for you today. Yeah. <laughs> How did you get into cannabis? Okay, so I was actually a patient before I became a physician. So I have a spinal condition, an arthritic spinal condition called ankylosing spondylitis. It's a big word. They call it AS for short. So it's um, a progressive arthritis of the spine. You get it as a teenager. And what ends up happening is your spine literally turns into a bamboo stick. So it's the bones, you know, they're normally rotating and you could bend forward and backward. They start to fuse together. And you lose mobility. You are very stiff. You have nerve pain. So most of my younger years as a teenager, I went to conventional doctors. Uh, I did epidurals, painkillers, muscle relaxants. Um, You know, I took over-the-counter anti-inflammatories. I did acupuncture. I did massage. But nothing really gave me long-lasting relief. And by the time I got to med school... I had this really big back brace that I would wear all the time. I carry it with me. And as long as I pulled it as tight as I could around my waist, it would give me some stability so I could stand, I could work in the hospital, I can assist in the OR for a few hours um, because I couldn't take meds while I was in school, right? Because it it makes you sleepy and you don't, you can't study if you're medicated. And one of my attendings pulled me aside one day and said, what's, what's this back brace? Why do you have this on all the time? I could I see you, you look uncomfortable. I told him I had AS and that I was really frustrated because here I was in the hospital, in medical school, all these wonderful doctors around me, these great medical minds, but no one could offer me any solution. Mm-hmm. It was the same set of medications or surgery mm-hmm. or an injection or steroids or medications again. So it was just like revolving door. And I know what it's like when you tell your doctor, I've tried everything and it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I'm back again. And they write the same prescription. And you're like, but this didn't work last time. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're like, well, try it again. Mm -hmm. Try it again this time. Maybe it'll work. Mm -hmm. So he handed me a tincture. Uh, It was this little bottle. And he didn't call it CBD oil. He didn't. He just said, this is marijuana. (laughs) And, um, you know, he says, my HIV and AIDS patients use it for their pain. And it really works. Uh, so I freaked out. I was really taken aback because he was one of my mentors and, uh, a physician. And here he is offering a med student marijuana. I was really scared, but I knew that if I didn't do something, I would not last. I would not be able to finish medical school. I would have to just drop out. So I did it on a weekend where I was off. And by Monday morning, I knew it was working. Wow. Yep. It only took a few days. I was less stiff. The pain had abated quite a bit. Uh, so I started taking it. I didn't tell anyone. I took it regularly. I usually did it you know, on the off days or at the end of the day. Uh, and it worked really well. And I decided to dedicate a career to learning about this plant-based medicine. So did you feel that you wanted to be a, a cannabis doctor right in the moment when you felt the relief that that tincture gave you? I did. I said it would be great if I could specialize in cannabis. You know, I said that to myself, but I said, oh my God, how would that look? Yeah, because back how? then it, it was not a field that you get into. Exactly. And I was in California. So I went to med school in California. California has had the longest legal program, I think 20 years now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was really in this middle of a switch box where I could learn regular medicine and go to medical school and learn from this newly legalized cannabis law. 
and it was very grassroots. Mm-hmm. I I didn't dare tell anyone that I was learning about it or trying to do it. I didn't want to learn lose my license. Right. Um, and here I was a young doctor, so I was embarrassed. You know, there's a few colleagues where I've talked about it to, and and they would say, "My God, you got to be careful." You know, you're going to lose your license. You're doing something totally illegal. Mm-hmm. So I did everything for a long time, at least 10 years without telling a single soul, without advertising, just by word of mouth, patients would come to me. So would you, so you would practice um, traditional, would you say, like medicine as well as alternative medicine for the patients who actually needed that yes. type of relief? Exactly. Would, yeah. So I would integrate it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And would you treat, would that also apply to kids too as well? So I treated a lot of children. Um, So most of the patients that came to me failed out of the regular medical system where they would say, I tried everything. I did surgery or the kids I would say, you know, had cancer or had uh, seizures that were not controlled by regular medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So back then too, you can't just go to a dispensary and, and get your products. How would your patients actually acquire these products? from drug dealers oh so my it's, gosh. it's an it was a very intricate underground market you know we call them angels now um or distributors uh, but they would get it through each other so the moms were really resourceful especially the moms they knew um you know which what grower where to get it they knew their source they were they were very um they did a lot of research they just researched everything they talked at a forum like a mom's group wow. And shared information on what worked, what didn't work, how to get it. And I took down all this information on my paper charts. Yeah. I did little spreadsheets and you know on, on paper and took down everything I could, all the information I could. And we started to extrapolate the data as we got more patient data, you know, what results worked, what plant didn't work, what ailment did it not work for. So we just really took everything down. So w- would these patients be actually making their own tinctures? Exactly. And topicals or whatever <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, they would make their own. And you would walk them through this, like, kind of, like, the, the, the I guess, the um, the chemistry of how, how to do this. Right. We'd, f- we'd figure it out together, uh, to be honest with you. Wow. So, and then I would talk to other alternative doctors. So we had this forum um, right outside of Los Angeles, and the doctors would meet, like, on a weekend for, like, their journal club. Oh, my god! <laughs> and we'd share stories, you know, what what worked, what didn't work, how about this? And so, this was all, like, underground. So what, were you frustrated that you're, you're doing this, and it's clearly working for a lot of your severe cases, and yet the system is still not set up for it to be legalized? Correct, yeah. You know, and it's like you can't really extend your work beyond underground level because you would get your license taken away right or yeah, i'd go to jail yes <laughs> no, no, even oh, worse yeah, yeah. oh my god it must be so frustrating then yeah but it was, it was so many patients that it, you're actually so overwhelmed by how much it worked and the amount of patients because once it worked for one patient they'd bring 10 yes exactly so it grew so quickly our practices grew so quickly we had three offices in california so were you at any point worried the fact I was that we very on worried. Your door? I was very worried, very very worried in the beginning. That's why I took such great data. That's why I, I took such great notes because I was so worried, and I wanted to make sure that I documented everything that I could possibly right. could right. Uh, right. to cover my butt. Right, right. So, <laughs> were you, did you had any encounter? Well, I didn't have any encounter with any um, narcotics enforcement officer until I moved to New York. To be really? honest with you. Yeah, so when I moved back here, I'm, I'm a Bronx native. I come back here to take care of my family. So about four years ago, they legalized it here in New York. And in the first year, um, the narcotics enforcement officer came twice wow. to my office. And it made me really nervous. I, bet I was re- oh my <laughs> really gosh. nervous. And basically, they audit your charts. Okay. They want to see that your paperwork's in order. You crossed your T's and you dotted your I's. And luckily, I had all of that experience from Mm -hmm. California. Mm -hmm. So I had everything electronic, and they just basically wanted to make sure that I was legit. But it was nerve-wracking. And so how have you seen the industry evolved from from that moment, Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's night and day now. now. You and I are having this podcast, (laughs) right? (laughs) Right, Yeah, where uh, it's much more open. There's definitely still a stigma to it. I think um, I would say, like, the baby boomers are still a little bit, Uh, I would say that generation, the golden generation, definitely. But uh, millennials and up, I think we're much more open to talking about it. Um, But I I bet that the cases that you're working on are still the same. They're still severe. They need a solution to the pain that they're going through, right? And so for all those patients, would you say that most of them can afford 
this alternative medicine? Alternative medicine in general is expensive, right? You're paying out of pocket, whether it's for something like CBD, a plant-based medicine, or you're buying nutritional supplements from Whole Foods, or you're trying to even eat a plant-based diet, right? Mm -hmm. You go to Whole Foods, you're spending a good amount, a chunk of money. Right, right. So in general, alternative medicine is more expensive. So do you find that there's a gap between those who really need it and those who can afford it? Yes, it's very difficult to find affordable uh, CBD medicine. Prices are all over the place. And prices are all over the place because you have this unregulated market. Mm -hmm. um, and the companies that are third-party testing, that are following regulations, uh, that are really um, growing good, organic, solvent-free, pesticide-free products that comes with a price tag. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that you just, you mentioned this um, often when we're not recording, but I wanted to kind of touch on this, that you provide actually free services to kids. Yes. That yeah. Can you talk more about that? Sure, sure. So I my Chinatown office is uh, grant-supported. So the children that come in, um, underserved, uh, they do not have to pay for my consultation fees at all. Oh, wow. Um, and it helps offset the cost a little bit. I, yeah. I hope that they would be able to budget for the, the CBD, the cannabis products more. And then in most of the cases you treat for kids, what, what are they usually? The kids, uh, a lot of cancer, oh. a, lot of, a lot of children with cancer, a lot of children with epilepsy, cerebral palsy, a lot of kids that have spinal cord injuries or um, brain injuries. Right. So I really usually see the most severe cases. The kids are really the sickest of the sick. Really? Right, right. Has it been tough? It's tough, but it's also very gratifying because yeah. when it works, it works really well. Right. And these are parents that have tried everything for their children. Um, so so it is quite quite gratifying. Has there been cases where they've tried the you know CBD and it hasn't worked? Absolutely. Yeah, cannabis is definitely not a silver bullet. Mm -hmm. There are cases where they've tried it and maybe it works for a little bit and then it stops working mm -hmm. and they have to find a different formula or different... Um, chemical variant mm -hmm. of the of the CBD or chem, or cannabis plant, um, and sometimes it just doesn't work at all. Sometimes it'll backfire, and the child will have severe side effects, like they get super hyper, mm -hmm. or they can't sleep, or they start bedwetting. So there there are things like that that come into play. So then, what happens to them? They have to stop the cannabis product. Yeah, and, and, and then know, look we, for another alternative. Another alternative. I'm sure they've tried the traditional way already, and now they're doing cannabis, and that's not working. That must be more frustrating. Yes, they've, they've exhausted every option already, and now they're they're reaching this point where this is not. But good. because, and you know, you we were talking um, before about the cannabis having over hundred chemical compounds. Yeah. So there are different formulations to try before giving up. Got it. Got it. So they would have to just navigate their way of trying to figure out what formulations work for that particular case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That must be so frustrating, though. Yeah. And then the same hand. You yeah, know. but it's new. It's a new. It's still in relatively, you know, at its infancy. Right. Um. Right. You know, CBD and cannabis. There's definitely more research that needs to be done, and we can see now how things have shifted. Is really into a, like a health and wellness model. Right. So preventative. Right. So um, some patients that are not as ill but want to take it preventatively, to not have arthritic pain or if they're training for you know that half marathon and they're noticing that they're mm. popping those motrins quite often they might use a cbd supplement instead of the motrin yeah, right yeah. Um, and that's where your cbd shop comes into play a lot of times you can come in for preventative care yeah. uh, as a natural supplementation yeah. and what made you go into this CBD. industry from fashion <laughs> blogging to health and wellness using I cbd <laughs> No, it's it's honestly the the last. I, if you asked me this, you know, when I was in high school, I probably didn't even understand what what CBD. <laughs> you know, right. and, and I grew up in in a time where it was a war on drugs. Say no to drugs, right? So dare, you know, all that, all those programs. So I think I was almost trained to be so skeptical and very nervous about anything that's not prescribed at a pharmacy or you know in a doctor's office. Um, no, but I I was. Um, Actually, it was a year ago. Um, so as a fashion blogger, I edit a lot. And when I edit, uh, Colin uh, would play something on the side for me. And it's usually just white noise that happens. But at the time, he played a Vice episode on how uh, parents were using CBD to, to treat their kids with epilepsy. And mm. I was thinking, like, this is so interesting. I, I've never heard of this. I've never heard of this that this was even possible. And a few episodes in, uh, they were talking about treating for depression and anxiety. 
and a few more episodes in like so i was just consuming cbd content as i was editing and i was like oh this is really kind of interesting and Colin and i were in amsterdam and i said hey nice. can't you, right <laughs> like the best place to, do, yes. to, to understand this world for research of course of course of course for research um and i was like oh let's stop by like a cannabis cafe because i've never seen that before you know i don't smoke i don't do any type of kind of in that side so i, I was just so curious so we walked into a few and i just didn't get it like i i just didn't understand it and I just I just felt unwelcome because mainly because I wasn't smoking so I think mm. if someone else was smoking they would probably understand that you know just the procedure is better in that sense um so I did that and then my just my curiosity just kept on growing mm. mainly because I felt like there's such an a huge benefit that no one's talking about so I ended up visiting almost every dispensary and CBD shop in San Francisco Los Angeles and New York within the last like you know basically few months and it was the same feeling that i got i just didn't understand the way the store was set up i didn't feel welcome and i just felt like an idiot to be honest with you like i didn't understand what dosing was you know all the stuff that we were talking about in the first two episodes that's like new light to me now because i didn't understand any of that and i just felt so kind of s- small and just stupid whenever i walked in and i didn't want that mm. that feeling and i i was determined to create a space where i I would love to have someone come in, like me, who wanted to learn and feel opened and welcome in there. My dream was to have a cannabis cafe on top where parents can come (laughs) in. Yeah, no, no joke, right? Parents can come in and have a community where moms can be together to help. I don't even know if this exists or not, Dr. June, but like, or maybe this would be like a dumb idea, but you know, for parents to be together as they help you know, dose and be with their kids and be with other kids who are having the same thing. So I wanted actually like a, I don't know what it's, I don't know what it's called, but like a a therapeutic side on top and just like a, you know, a shop and a cafe in the bottom. I love that. And it just, it's just been stewing, stewing and it just, you know, and all that logistically was just not possible for a little shop like what we have now. Um, But with Artemis, we wanted to create a world that was old meets new. Uh, because cannabis is old, right? It's yeah. been with us for so long, and now it's just a new thing again. And also where we created a, a feeling of a different world. So we lined our shops with old books, like, you know, everywhere, mm. the old meets new, next to cement vases that f- feels like it's been weathered and there for so long, which we handmade everything. And then, you know, we have a cement bench lined with cypress trees to make if you feel like you're entering an open space, but you happen to be inside. But the whole point is that just to lift you up and put you in a world that feels very welcoming, that none of your questions are ever stupid, how I felt when I walked into these stores and that we had answers for you. So when we started the shop, we did a lot of research, read almost everything that we could, you know, out there and then figure out what is it that we're looking for. And then we contacted all of the brands, looked at their lab reports, make sure they're selling. What Incredible. They they're selling. Yeah. Um, and then we thought wouldn't it be great to actually have an authority figure to come in and actually to help educate not only our our customers but myself too and then given this resource and providing it for everyone and then you emailed me like literally the day <laughs> the store opened i was like oh my gosh it, it's gonna happen so th- the whole idea of the podcast was just to create this environment where it's just everyone and it, it's available to everyone you know whether you want to step in the store or not mm. I, I don't you know we don't really care as long as you can get the help that you need and that's the forefront of our minds all the time you know that you Feel good, look good, and be good. And that's mm. it. Yeah. You know, that's kind of the store space that, that we wanted to create. But, you know, and then I also find that there's 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 women in cannabis, would you say, but there's not that many cannabis license holders that are women? Yes, you're right. Um, women are a minority in terms of business owners right. uh, in the cannabis space. Uh, but women tend to seek cannabis more than men openly, um, and I think it's because women are more resourceful. You know, they're the nurturers, they're caregivers. They want to think outside the box and look for alternatives. When something's not working, women are the first to say, well, I'm going to find out something that will work. Wow. And they're not afraid of that. Right. right? We are not afraid of that. Right, 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 right. And we right. as women. Right. So, um, but in terms of being entrepreneurs in the cannabis space, it's been an uphill battle for women in general. What do you think that is? I think investors, so Big money, private equity, venture capitalists tend to be male-dominated industry. Women are um, less likely to get funded. So that's, uh, that's just a good. fact. Mm-hmm. So I think um, when you hold a license, when you open up a shop, it is a tremendous capital that you have to put in. 
mm-hmm. both time, money, you know, resources. It, it's a, it's a big project. No, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> so you have to get be able to get out a loan or mm-hmm. to be able to find an investor. Um, so that's I think it, it's a little bit trickier. Yeah. For for women. Yeah. So we basically took all of our savings. <laughs> And then open the shop. So instead of looking to buy a place, we basically have the shop now, you know. And then that is a huge concern of mine because I I see the shop and as a daily reminder of is this a good decision or a bad decision, right. you know. And right. and just but to be honest with you, like meeting the customers every day that walk in, like I understand why there's a need for this and there is a true need for it, and it's not a fad because when it works, it's work and it's not snake oil like that we talked about, right? You know, in the past, but it's just. There is there is a definitely need for just an open conversation and just more education around what exactly are you taking? Because we you know we read um, food labels now, right? And we yeah. read makeup labels now. And yes. I think that's going to be the same thing with CBD. We have to read the labels to make sure that these ingredients are truly what it is and that what it does for you. Exactly. Yeah. There's just so much misinformation out there. There's very few trusted resources. Um, and for you to be able to have a space and also the educational component so clients can walk away just knowing that much more. So maybe they don't buy something from your shop, but they know when they sift exactly. through the internet, there's a lot of BS. Right, 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 right. Right. So they're in that much of a better place. Right, right. So what I think you mentioned your toughest case in the first episode was the, the little girl that you treated. How is she doing now? She's great. Oh! Yes. So it took a while to find the right cannabis, uh, quote unquote, strain, the, the cannabis chemovar, the formula that works. But she probably seizes on average, maybe two to three times a month where she was seizing wow. 100 times a day. So she and before she was non ambulatory. So she didn't walk. She didn't talk. She can say mama. She goes to special occupational therapy. She goes to speech therapy and she can sit up. She can't walk, but she can sit up. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. And she's not in pain. She's not on the floor seizing all day long. Oh so my it's gosh. huge. I take that as a win. Oh. Yeah. That is so amazing. Um, that uh, Thank you for sharing. It, 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 I think it comes in full circle, you know, and, and your journey, it comes in full circle too because you were a patient once and now you're treating. So you actually have the empathy, I think, code in you to know what it feels like to go to the doctor and feel frustrated that you cannot get the answers that you need and you are the answer now for so many people, including all of our viewers, you know, including everyone who's listening and all of the clients that walk into a store. You know, it's just like we really value that you took that risk because not I think, I think a lot of, it's really hard to take that risk at that age where you could have been fined or taken away or in jail for what you were doing. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I appreciate those words. But for for both of us as chronic pain survivors, yeah. when when you need something for quality of life and you've searched and no one could give you an answer and you figure out an answer, you want to share it with the world. Right. Right. <laughs> right. 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 No, absolutely. But that is going to be our discussion for today. We get an inside glimpse of Dr. June's heart and head. So that was great. I really love this 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 talk that we had. Um, for next week, we're going to talk about CBD and stress and anxiety. So we'll oh, get big into, one. Yeah, we'll get into that because I'm looking really forward into that too. But thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you for listening. Bye. Bye.